I really love bacon and I always have when uh, my wife used to babysit kids and we'd make breakfast and they would eat all the bacon before I would get a chance to get any I used to be pretty upset about that <laughs> my her family heritage included uh, butchering on both sides of my family my mother's side which were from the south and my father's side which was from southeastern Pennsylvania this area right here actually the Pigeon Hills and um, as I was growing up I heard stories of butchering and and uh, being self-sufficient and uh, so I just thought it would be a nice thing to do uh, for our family because we are into self-sufficiency and uh, my wife's family especially tries to find any excuse they can to get together and have a party. So, <laughs> so we found it to be especially rewarding to get the family together once a year and, uh, and do some hog butchering. So did you build this trailer? Yeah. You did that's a good nifty. job. Yeah, that's, that's nice. Sure. It yeah. looks perfect for what yeah. you do. Yep. Yeah. You ready? Yep. Just take your time. He's on camera. quite a few times already haven't you? <laughs> so um, we do we try to do everything um, the way they did years ago we try to make as much use out of the animal as we can uh, we try to dish <clears throat> we try to we we make pun hoss which is also known as scrapple and uh, we also make lard which is a staple. We've tried scalding the hogs, which was the really old time way, and we've we've done that already. And and uh, now we've we've been skinning the hogs, and which most people prefer that. The whole process is just very tiring, but we always we look forward to it. But also look forward to uh, getting done because I'm usually. We're usually wore out by the time that the process is done. So this is just the icing on the cake here, getting to getting to try our new bacon for the year. Um, and uh, it won't be too long here till it's ready to eat. Another thing I wanted to mention was was and is that we try to do uh, the old-fashioned country curing, and which is a pleasure. Uh, to try to duplicate how they did things years ago before they had refrigeration and and freezers um, for the way they, they they were able to preserve their meat doing that so i think our bacon here is about done and uh, i'm going to get it out here and we're going to do a little sampling of that and i'm using this uh three prong fork that my daughter-in-law loves so much I did it, I'm using that special for her. <laughs> of course, I'm just picking on her by doing that. 
<clears throat> this is this is the bacon fork. <laughs> Dad would always talk about this and he'd always say, you know, I'd I'd really like to really like to do this again someday. He said, Dad raised them, he said, my dad raised them a couple times and he said, I really enjoyed that. He said, we should do that. So one year, uh, one of my friends in school, we started this probably about six, seven years ago, doing the hog butchering and stuff. And one year uh, in school, one of my friends that I was in the Future Farmers Club with, he, uh, somebody told me that he was he had some piglets that his one of his sows had piglets so i talked to him and he said yeah he said i'll i'll sell you some piglets so we uh we went over to his place over here over by east berlin and he he sold us two piglets so we this was the, a new thing to us we never did anything we had this we had this old pen here. This, we had tried we had tried horses for a little while. We're back here in the woods, so they didn't work. So we had this old horse pen, and we decided, well, we're gonna see if it works for pigs. So we, the first year, we took and put chicken wire up and stuff, and worked all right. I put some electric wire. Um, they still got out where they got out where there wasn't these kind of fences they get through the electric wire so we spend half the time chasing these dumb pigs around we got them in like august and come february we decided we were going to kill these things and we'd never done this before we figured they were like 300 some pounds so a guy at dad's work said i'll come up and show you how to kill them he said i've been doing this a long time he come up here he looked at these hogs and goes they're a lot bigger than that we, uh, we killed them, we took them down to a butcher bef before we had our setup in here uh, with the cooler and stuff. We took it down to a friend of ours who's a butcher and he, uh, he, put, he put them on the scales and weighed them after they were already dead. And he said they were, one was probably about 450 live and one was about 500. Whereas all the ones we buy now are about three to 350 we that they were huge hogs we hung them from the bucket of the backhoe and the, their noses touched the ground i mean they were huge and we got so much lard it was like four inches of fat on them from all that slop feeding but we uh that was our first experience with it so then the next year we thought well we're going to try this again so we we got three from a guy and again they were running all over the place so we uh we re redid our fence and it went better that year well we uh we killed them and then the next year i i uh, graduated from high school and met my wife and got married and dad said well i'm not raising them myself he said so we're gonna we're gonna buy them from now on so we uh we started buying them from the guy we get now which in the long run it's easier i don't know <sighs> It, it is he gives us some really good deals it's about the same as if we'd have if we'd have to buy feed it would probably be more expensive for us to actually raise them than it would be for him to raise them um but one just that's how we got started we just six seven eight years ago whatever it is now we just one day decided let's do it let's try it let's stop talking about it and try it and we keep doing it every year and we love it it's a good way to get the family together it's a good way to spend uh new year's we always do it new year's weekend and it's it's always family and fellowship and we've had some friends come and do it with us every year it gives us all a reason to get together and in the long run it helps us it helps us with our with our food larders for the year it uh 
I know for me and my wife and our little girl, a hog, a hog is more than enough to get us through the, through the year. ancestors wise that I knew my great grandparents on both sides of my family butchered and I you know heard stories from all of them um, you know from the making of the pawn hoss to the cleaning of the casings they would use the bladder they made sausage with the bladder but they also they also could um, use the bladder to seal the crock they would take the bladder after they filled a crock with the puddings and uh, lay the bladder across the top and string, put a string around it to tie it and then when it dried it made like a lid and I uh, all different kinds of things you know we put everything in the freezer today but back then they would pack their meat in crocks or or a hoxit which is a big wooden barrel and they would stuff it with salt you know because they didn't have no freezer or smoke it um, but if you wanted fresh meat, the, f the fresh way to do it was to put it in that hoxit and uh, pack it with salt. 
and then they would, when they wanted a loin or whatever, you go to the hoxit and dig it out of the salt, and and you had it. Nothing that I experienced. That's just stuff I know. It's like 50, 60 years since that generation did it, but it's because of uh, you know after World War II and the accessibility of buying, going to the store, it. It got forgotten a lot of this stuff especially like the cleaning of the intestines and using them and and all the parts of the pig that can be used the people got away from it because they could just go to the store and buy their sausage and uh, we just noticed while we started this that nobody here under the age of 60 knew anything about cleaning and testing so we had to try it and give, give it a try <laughs> learn we wanted to learn how to do it but I heard I heard stories about that since I was a kid you know we're doing this to, to learn how to do it it saves us money and and we're just trying to revive some of the old world ways and and learn how to do it but those people had to do it out of necessity it had to be done you know it was the only way they survived if they if that if they got piglets and and they had three and they lost one that was a big loss for their for their livelihood that could mean life or death getting through winter and that's only 110 20 years ago especially for the people in rural communities um so it's pretty important to to learn the past and and try to keep some of it alive so so if we ever come to that point again, we don't starve to death. <laughs> so. Like Sean said, we don't have to rely on the meat as much as what they did in the late 1800s, early 1900s. We were very, this generation is very spoiled in the fact that we can, if we need meat, we can go to the store and pick out what we want and that night it's on our table frying. Back then they didn't have that, they just, they had to live off of what they had. If they ate all the meat before the next, before next fall when they butchered again, they didn't have any more pork. That was it until fall when they killed more. And then they'd have to live off of other stuff. And we're just very fortunate as a generation and not too many people realize that. Um, a lot of people don't realize anymore where their food actually comes from or how it starts and I think, that's another reason that we enjoy this so much because in the future we can pass it down to our kids and um, it's just something that I hope will live on. Um, I hope our kids all take it over and keep going and going and going. Um, and someday, like Sean said, maybe there will be a necessity that you got to do this to eat, but hopefully it don't get that way. But. Uh, people people don't realize how fortunate they are anymore um, and it's just it's it's fun to be able to do this and live out a piece of history every year and I'm I'm really really glad that I got a wife that's willing to uh, sit there and scrape uh, pig intestines out for sausage cation she we were all ready to give up on it and she was determined to to make it to make it work because she she wanted to do from head to toe on that tall hog and she she got it she figured it out so next year we're gonna put more time in it but i'm very fortunate i got a wife that's uh, not afraid to get her hands dirty landon is my husband and um when i met him i knew nothing about processing or butchering pigs or deer or pretty much any animal. I didn't know anything about it. And it's just been really cool to be able to learn these things, learn these skills and uh, for him to be able to teach me a little bit and for us to learn together these skills of processing and butchering our own food is so helpful to be able to do this kind of stuff as a financial aspect to it it saves us hundreds of dollars and the quality of meat is way better than what you can get in the store i mean pork chops in the store are like this thick we can get our pork chops like it's a good hefty piece of meat um 
So just, and being able to, you know, get these, we know where the meat's coming from. You know, in the store, you don't, you know, it comes from a farm, but you don't know which farm it came from. You don't know what the farm owners did with their animals. You don't know what they fed them. We know we got them locally sourced from a good farmer friend of ours. And um, we know that <clears throat> he's good to his animals. He knows he gives them good food and it's just, it's good fun. It's dirty, it's hard work, but it's, it's good fun. This is like the best thing to do. You can like never not do this. I'm, I'm making this fat get cooked brown. You see how I'm doing it? Just stir it and stir it and stir it. It's pretty fun. It's pretty fun? Mm hmm Like if you want to have fun, this is better than screaming on a roller coaster. I like the way you look at that. It's a lot of work though, isn't it? Yeah. I can only, this seems so easy, but it isn't. Just, it, you seem like this is a lot of light work. Hello. No, it's a lot of hard work. It's, it's really heavy though. Know. This isn't light to me because, well, I've been lifting a lot of things. And my, and my baby period was like epic. My baby period was the best. I've been a butcher for since about 2008. I don't butcher anymore, but I spent about 10 years butchering. A little bit of the history, some of it's already been delved into the ancient history, but the more modern history was there was a lot more butcher shops that would have USDA inspectors and they would come in and they would, they would slaughter beef and pigs and other animals. They would be inspected for quality, diseases, abscesses, things like that. So you want to inspect the meat, check glands. And when you're saving everything, you can save the, you can save the tongue out of here, all the head meat the jowl meat, all the stuff here. We have three hogs already done up. We've got three more hanging. This is what's gonna be in our sausage. That'll get ground up. You'll add your seasonings and then you can either bag it loose, what they call loose sausage. The only difference is, is if, if you use intestine cases, what, the, what was normally used, it was usually saved out of the hogs to make your sausage casings. That's what. That's the tubes that the meat goes into. So we'll, we'll grind this all up later on today, mix it up, bag it and stuff it you know, for whatever, whatever people who want in their meat. We, we typically write down everything out of the hog that we want to do. How many, how many chops per pack? That's, that's your typical old school butchering methods. You have a cutting table here Bringing, bringing them in half at a time up here on the table. We'll, we'll take a saw, cut the, cut the hocks off, cut the feet off, separate out all, the, all what's called subprimals. And then we'll break them down either on a bandsaw or you can use a knife. But since they have bones in them, we use a bandsaw to cut through the meat. In the grocery store setting, most most grocery store clerks now, they're not even meat cutters anymore. There's a few grocery stores that have gotten away from it. They just mass produce all the cuts into pre-packaged packs that go right to a grocery store now. Most, most old school meat cutters, some can remember back upon a time from like up to about the 80s, maybe even the 90s, where grocery stores got away and just went into cryovac box beef. So you would take it out and either cut it with a knife if it was boneless or if it had a bone and cut it on a saw. Now they don't even have, some butcher shops don't, have sold all the equipment out of it, they don't even have it anymore. So even the basic knowledges of cutting up 
chops or steaks or anything like that on a saw is being lost to the ages because, well, it's all done in factories now. But the, the problem is I think it's a little short-sighted because the long haul is, as these generations die off, that knowledge is gonna be ever more lost and they haven't invented a machine yet that I know of that can render a beef or a pig down. But you lose the choice too. If you want a certain size chop, some people like them thin, some people like it thick. It's, you're, you're, you're losing so much of that that you, it's hard to imagine what it's gonna look like in another 10 years because within the last 10 years, they've pretty much done away with cutting inside of grocery stores across America. It takes away jobs, of, skilled labor jobs for, good, for people in their local communities. You don't know where your food comes from. You don't know how your food is made. So, and you're, and you're losing it to bigger and bigger conglomerates that have bought up pretty much all the real estate and all the business to, to uh, but when you have a local farmer and local butchers, you can guarantee a better quality product and with people you know in your community. See that? There's the loin in there. With a saw, they start up here and go and you want to cut it nice and even so that the way there's a cavity within the spinal uh, cavity here so that way you can get all the, the spinal cord out. What's that? This piece of meat. Meat? Cool. Yeah, part of the, part of the, part of what's called the, the, the skirt or the breathing muscle. It's what helps, helps support the lungs. Now what's on this? This is fat. It's just the fat off the animal. There's a lot of fat. It is. There's a lot of fat on pigs. How pig? And it's very gooey. See, if you pinch it, it's very... Pig well, fat's a lot different than beef fat. Pigs are really big. Mm -hmm. So what's that right there? That's the ham. Oh, the ham. Yep, this is the ham here. And these are the ribs. So you got ribs, don't you? <laughs>
All right, well, this is deer meat and pork mixture here. Um, we already ground all our pork, and we, use, we usually like to save our deer meat throughout the year and do stuff with it after deer season's over, make bologna, make sausage, make burger as we need it. Um, we always like to save the deer meat and mix it in with some pork because it makes things go a little farther. Instead of having 30 pounds of pork and 40 pounds of deer burger or something, now we have 70 pounds of deer sausage, which has pork mixed in it to take away some of the gamey deer flavor. Um, but it still tastes like sausage. It's got all the same same ingredients in it as our pork sausage. It just has uh, two-thirds deer in it and one-third pork. So we do that to make things just go a little go a little farther and to use everything that we have, use the pork and the deer, and it still it still tastes like sausage. It just gives it a little to us a better flavor. Some people don't care for deer meat, but uh, we do so we like to do that just to make things go a little farther um, Today's our sausage making day. We seasoned everything last night when we got done cutting and stuff so Today we're grinding and they're stuffing and putting in bags down there They're gonna be doing rope sausage for this and some of the some of the fresh stuff is gonna be rope um, We're doing this to kill time while we're waiting on the pond hoss bones to get done cooking and then we're going to take and when they get done cooking we're going to pick them off and run them them through the grinder and then everything goes back in the kettles and gets cornmeal and flour and salt and pepper mixed with it and then that's the start of our pun hoss and that's got to cook down but this is just a time killer for now until that stuff comes out of the kettle so uh we uh we just try and make as much time as we can and everybody has a job to do and we do it so So this uh, <clears throat> sugar cure recipe, I tried to, I tried when we first started doing this, I, I was around it when I was younger, but <clears throat> at that age, I really didn't pay attention to all the ingredients. I know my dad used to do it and I never really paid that much attention to, of the different 
recipe that he used for the sugar cure. And uh, so when we started doing this, <clears throat> I searched and uh, found some recipes and um, tried them and wound up <clears throat> improvising and modifying the recipes that we found. And uh, till finally, I added a little bit of this and subtracted a little bit of that until finally now we got it to where we, where we like it. It just was a trial and error of uh, playing with it and tinkering with it, and, and uh, I think we got it pretty good now. It's uh, the old time way of doing it, and uh, we take and, <clears throat> and do a, a rub, and then the, the bacons here, they, they sit, like I said before, they'll sit for two, about two days like this, and during that time you'll see the juice will run all out of it and down onto the floor and, and uh, that means that the cure is working when you see that. That's good. That's what you want to see. Because that means it's, uh, it's soaking into the meat. Now the hams again, like I said before, they, <clears throat> it, takes, it takes longer with the hams because it's a bigger piece of meat. Um, after the after the curing is done, then I have a smokehouse that I built, and uh, I'll <clears throat> I do cold smoking, where uh, you you don't use a hot fire. Um, that's why they call it cold smoking. You just you just do a cold, uh, subtle smoke, which draws into the meat and flavors it without cooking it. Now, my understanding is you can't you can't sell it to the public that way and places that do sell it to the public they get their when they smoke it they get their meat up to uh, 150 160 degrees which uh, is makes it legal to to sell to the public but we don't sell to the public so uh, we just do the cold smoke and the cold smoke is is uh, really the old traditional way you still get the flavor, and you're not actually cooking the meat. Now, with the preservative in here, um, the meat doesn't spoil after it, after it draws the cure in. Um, so it really doesn't have to be cooked. The curing agent keeps it from spoiling. So this is something that we just... We do this for one, for several reasons, but uh, one was like um, <clears throat> my son. My son used was kill quite a few deer every year, so we needed pork to add with the deer meat from the deer he'd shoot. So then we <clears throat> started doing pigs, um, so that we had pork to add with the deer meat. Well, um, it sort of kept growing into what it is now where uh, friends and family get involved in it which is great um, I just in love I, I love the whole we love the whole family experience and uh, carrying on the old-time traditions um, so uh, it's a lot of work I uh, actually sort of kind of dread it when I think about it ahead of time but yet at the, <laughs> at the same time I look forward to it because it's a good family time. Uh, we uh, get to eat together some really good old country meals and, and uh, have some good time of fellowship together. Now, if you take notice, this one here is changing colors already. It's, it's starting to turn dark. And what that is, is that's the curing agent starting to work. It's actually turning the, the meat a darker color. Um, the curing agent is a sodium nitrite, um, which, <clears throat> well, best I can say, it does something to the moisture in the meat, in the cells of the meat, um, that it keeps it from spoiling. Years ago, before they had refrigeration, this is the way they had to cure their meat, or keep their meats, by, by the curing. That way they... They really didn't need refrigeration or freezers to, to keep their meat. 
And when you when you cure these this meat, like the ham especially, but you, you try to get it in alongside the bone like that, because uh, now these small pieces here uh, isn't too much of a concern with that, but the, the hams, you got to make sure you get that in down alongside the bone uh, in order to, to penetrate the whole way through that big piece of meat. Um, curing hams can be a little tricky because it's such a thick piece sometimes it doesn't get the whole way down into the to the bone and that's where they'll spoil is in here around the bone so uh, I'm I was told by some knowledgeable old timers that you take and try to squeeze it down in the down alongside that bone there that's called the H bone you try to squeeze it down in there the best you can and get some penetration on it and then that'll soak down in there and you'll get it'll it'll work its way down in along the bone so far knock on wood I've done probably about uh, 25 hams and haven't lost any yet so <laughs> I'm pretty happy with that every culture every Every race of people in the United States, in particular, did something. Unless they didn't eat hogs for, unless they didn't eat hogs for a religious reason, they 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 butchered, um, you know. To and it, it's important. I, I don't know how to say it. It's important to for them to step back and and you know you can't live in the past, but it's definitely important to remember the past so you know where you came from and you retain some of these skills because they are important in life and make you a better person, especially if you know where your ancestors are from and what they did.